Good morning. Good morning. Some of you are wondering, what did I get myself into? <laughs> Hey, uh, we are at the, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of uh, a time where we're going to go through the book of, of Mark from beginning to end. Uh, the, the Bible is not a single book. It is actually a collection of 66 books written over centuries and centuries and centuries for folks from all kinds of different backgrounds, all agreeing on the same thing. And so we're going to take a look at just one of those books, and it's the book of Mark. If you have a Bible, you'll open it to the book of, of Mark. If you don't, that's fine. You can either just listen or in front of you, uh, uh, if you're not sitting in the front row, that is, there is a uh, Bible. There should be a Bible uh, down there that you can borrow, and it's page 707. If you grab one of those Bibles, it's really easy to get to. It's page 707. If you don't have one of those Bibles, that page number will not help you. Uh, which is why we put, they put in chapters and verses so we can all find our, our way around to the same place. While you look up uh, the book of Mark, um, let me give you a little background. Um, Mark, the guy who wrote this book, is the cousin of Barnabas. And he traveled shortly with Barnabas and Paul on what we call their first missionary journey. It was the first time that they left their hometown and went from city to city and city to let people know about the good news about Jesus. In the middle of that trip, Mark uh, left them for reasons that are uh, unknown to us, but they were a big enough thing where Paul did not trust Mark. He doubted his dependability, and when it came to go on the next trip and Barnabas said, hey, let's bring my cousin along, Paul was like, "Uh uh-uh, won't do it. And actually caused a division between Paul and Barnabas. Later, however, uh, Paul would eventually speak highly of Mark. But more importantly, Mark would attach himself to the apostle Peter. And the information that's recorded here in the, in the book of Mark actually comes from Peter's sermons that Mark had heard over and over and over and over again. This, this is a faithful firsthand account of what Peter experienced and Mark heard directly from him many, many times. However, Mark's message is his own. Of, of all the information that he heard, the, the way he's organized, and the audience that he's writing to is a non-Jewish audience that lives at the very center of the world, if you would, at that time. All roads lead to Rome. And this uh, is written to those in Rome. So if you'll open with me, and we're going to start right at the beginning. I'm going to read uh, uh, the first few paragraphs, or we call them uh, verses 1 through 15, if you're following along there. And Mark starts out his letter this way. He says, In the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once... The Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of heaven of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. He is here. He is here. This is Mark's 
basic message. In, in the very first sentence here, Mark makes a bold claim that is uh, meant to get his audience's attention and to make them want to hear more. Right from the beginning, Mark makes an impression. He declares that he has some eongelion. Now, I'm sure you're looking at your Bible going, eongelion, I don't see that. That's the Greek word that's translated good news. Now, this word was familiar to the non-Jewish audience that he'd write to because it refers to a messenger who would bring news of peace and prosperity in regards to a signed treaty or the winning of the war. Remember, this is a time there's no cell phones, no telephone for that matter, let alone the internet. And for information is slow moving. And when your armies, when your folks went off to fight, you could have lost the war months before you found out things were about to change. And so a messenger would be sent to kind of give a, a report. And when that messenger came through town, everybody would know the messenger has come. Remember, these are small towns. Everybody knows everything. But he doesn't tell anybody. He goes and gives a report to the king. And then the king would announce to the people while they're kind of waiting. And when that messenger brought news that the, a treaty had been signed, or more importantly, that the general or the, maybe the king himself has won the war way before the armies returned, way before other news is returned, they would call that eongelion. It originally was determined just for the messenger, and, and, and then it became about the message itself. In fact, um, in 9 BC, this is within a decade of Jesus' birth, the birthday of Caesar Augustus was hailed as Eongelion. Why did they say his birthday was Eongelion? Because he was hailed as a god. Augustus' birthday signaled the beginning of good news for the world. So when Mark declares to these Romans that he has some Eongelion, they take note. Now, especially take note, because he refers to the person not just by his name, Jesus, but by his title, Christ. It's not his last name, it's his title. The non-Jews of Rome weren't necessarily looking for this Christ, but they were familiar with the word. Much like you and I may be familiar with the word jihad. You don't have to be Islamic you don't have to have been raised to understanding what that is. We know what jihad is. We know what the murmurs are. We know what's happening around the world. A lot of it has to do with, with that word. It comes packaged. We may not fully understand it, but we're familiar with it. In the same way, they would know that Christ was this Jewish idea of anointed one who is prophesied that he would come, that he would overthrow Rome, restore Israel as a superpower, and bring everyone under the one true and only God. Now that's worth noting, but, but what really gets their attention when Mark writes is that he refers to Jesus as the Son of God. Now the Greeks and Romans believed in many gods, and they also believed that at times these gods would come and live among them. I often already mentioned that Caesar Augustus claimed to be a god. What is unique about Mark's opening statement is that he doesn't just claim that he is the son of a God, but that he was the son of the God. The Roman gods and their sons and daughters on earth were very fallible, you got to understand, and often they weren't very nice. However, the idea that there was only one true God and that his one and only son had come as a conquering hero well, this news was worth serious consideration. After this pretty incredible opening sentence, Mark goes into a, a couple familiar passages to the Jews. They would be familiar that, that Mark quotes both from Isaiah and Malachi. You will see these references in your notes. Now, the, the, in the Bible that you read, you only read the prophet Isaiah, and, and it's very common in this day and time that the greater prophet covers, if you would, the lesser prophet. Isaiah was known as a great prophet, uh, it was one of the greater prophets, and Malachi is the lesser, so they would just claim Isaiah's authorship of both, but it comes from Isaiah and Malachi. Most of the Jewish audience in Rome would understand the correlation directly. 
They understood that each of these passages referred to prophecies in the Hebrew Scriptures, we also call that the Old Testament, that God would send a herald to announce the coming of the Messiah. Now, they would have been taught from their earliest years that this herald would have been Elijah. In fact, if you were to go to a Seder today, that's a celebration of the Passover, you know, the Prince of Egypt movie. When the Jews celebrate the Passover today, at the very end of that celebration, they open the door and they often end with the line, next year in Jerusalem. Now, the reason they do that is because of this prophecy that Elijah would precede the Messiah. So what they're doing is they're opening the door and expectations with hope that he may come in. As a matter of fact, many times if you you were to sit at a family seder, there's a whole place set up that no one sits at for Elijah. Because the hope and prayer is that Elijah will come and next year we'll all be in Jerusalem under, under the new kingdom. However, for the Gentile or the non Jewish audience that this was written to, they might not have understood this absolute connotation, though they probably might have found out from their Jewish friends. But what they did understand was that Jesus didn't just come onto this scene, but he was a fulfillment of something promised that was prophesied centuries before. He is here. After saying that the, at this prophet, that this, this uh, preceder of Jesus would come, he goes right to telling you who he is. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't have to have years of knowing how to study the Bible to understand what's going on here. He says, Jesus is the one. You know this Messiah because uh, someone's coming, and now here he is. His name is John. He doesn't tell us vaguely. He tells us specifically about John, who was known as the baptizer. And then he paints a picture of John in a way that the Jews would clearly understand who he was intended to be. See, he's identified as one who lives in the desert. That is a place that God engaged most of the prophets of old. It's a common denominator. What's easy for you and I to read over is also explains that the wardrobe of camel's hair that John wrote and a leather belt, this matches exactly, by the way, the description of Elijah the prophet, the expected one. Now, it's hard to know whether or not the folks in in Rome who had not grown up Jewish for the most part had heard of John. They may have heard it from from other Jewish folks, or he may have just been known because he was a pretty critical guy in his day. In fact, Josephus, the secular historical writer, writes about John. And this is what he writes. Now, some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God. Now, notice here, he's not claiming this. He's a secular writer. He's an historical writer. He's not a religious man. He's saying this is what they claimed. And that it was a punishment for what he did against John called the baptizer, known as the dipper. For Herod had him killed, although he was a good man, and urged the Jews to exert themselves to virtue, both as to justice towards one another and reverence towards God, and having done so, to join together in washing. For immersion in water, it was clear to him, could not be used for the forgiveness of sins, but as a sanctification of the body, and only if the soul was already thoroughly purified by right actions." And when others masked about him, for they were generally moved by his, being John's words, Herod, who feared that such strong influence over the people might carry to a revolt, for they, being the crowd, seemed to be ready to do anything he should advise, Herod believed it much better to move now than later and have it raised to a rebellion and engage him in actions that he would regret. Now, the reason that's important, the reason I read that to you, is I want you to understand, this is not just a bunch of people getting together and putting together some stories, right? And in hopes that people will believe. Uh, time after time after time again, history and the things that we can prove, we can't, you can't prove a miracle, but you can prove that the people that were there were there. I just read another article this week that, that many people thought that it was an exaggeration about all these sacrifices and whatnot that were happening in Jerusalem. And I read an article that just this week they found a pile of bones that suggests just that. 
that the central economy of Jerusalem in the first century was revolved around this animal sacrifice. Lo and behold, the experts are proved wrong again in the Bible right. And I don't say that pridefully. I'm just saying that's truthfully. And here's a secular historical writer who says, you know, all this thing you read in the Bible about, well, yep, he existed. This was his message. And yes, he was killed for it. Now, the interesting thing is though John fits the profile of the great prophets of old, right? His message is about repent. That's, that's, a, that's a common theme. His, his message is about the Messiah. It is unique, though. It, it is unique because he doesn't talk about the Messiah as way out there. He talks about the Messiah as right around the corner. And the other thing is he doesn't, he doesn't talk about the Messiah in a way that they, that they really are used to understanding. They, they talk, he talks about him in a way that, that makes him very mighty and very powerful. I mean, what's interesting is that John is, is known as a great prophet in his own right. But yet when he describes this one who is to follow, he says, I'm not even worthy to strap his sandals. Some of you may remember a, an event several years ago where someone uh, insulted our president with the worst thing that they could do. They took their shoe and threw it at him. Because in the Middle East, the foot and the shoe is the worst insult you could give someone. And strapping and putting someone's sandals on, that was reserved for not just the servants, but the servants of the servants who were at the bottom of the rung. And John, a great prophet of his own right, says, there's one coming after me. I wouldn't even be worthy to strap his sandals. A much different message. One of the main differences here is that though John uses water as a symbol, that all people should repent. It's a symbol. The one who follows him will use the Holy Spirit to empower people. The, the water is a symbol of, of repentance. He will actually give the Holy Spirit, which empowers people, gives them the ability to live differently from the inside out. He is here. And Mark, in, in fashion, this is his introduction. He waits, wastes no time. He goes right and introducing us who this is. This great bearer, if you would, of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus. John ceremoniously baptizes Jesus, but what follows shows that his baptism is much more than just ceremony. As we look in verses 9 through 11. When Jesus comes up from the water, he experiences three things that in Jewish tradition signify the inauguration of God's kingdom and the age of the Messiah. The first is the cry of Isaiah 64.1. Isaiah 64.1. And that cry is that the heavens were opened above him. The second thing is the presence of the Holy Spirit, which descends upon him. In recent years, we have found some ancient writings that happened around the first century called from Qumran. You might be familiar with that. In these writings... They teach that this community, this Jewish community, above all, believed that the age of the Messiah would be endowed by God's Spirit. Finally, the third is that the heavenly voice which speaks to him. And this declaration, you are my son whom I love. Now, this does not establish a relationship so much as presuppose a relationship. It's not a declaration of where we're at now. It's a declaration of, of my, uh, their relationship throughout history prior to that point. The concurrence of these momentous events at the baptism signals that Jesus is the more powerful one, John's words, that he was talking about. He, being Jesus, is the promised one of the Hebrew scriptures and the inaugurator of God's kingdom. He is here. From there, verse 12, from the baptism where God marks Jesus as the special one he loves, Jesus goes to the wilderness. But even here we see that Jesus is no ordinary man. First, he goes to the wilderness because he's led there by the Holy Spirit. See, the ways of Jesus aren't the decisions of a mere man, even a religious one, but it's the direct leading of God via the Holy Spirit. Second, the great adversary, 
The, the word in your Bible that says Satan, that, that literally means adversary. The adversary himself shows up to trip up Jesus. Not just for a moment, but for 40 days. For 40 days. And under the worst of circumstances. I don't know about you, but you know, when temptation comes right after a church service, I'm usually pretty good. Not always, but I'm usually pretty good. But you catch me when I'm tired, hungry, and hot. It don't take much. <laughs> And that's exactly the, what we see here in the life of Jesus. And he proves faithful for 40 days. Now, the symbolic meaning of this 40 days is not lost in those who are familiar with Hebrew scriptures. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and nights. Exodus 34, 28. Exodus 34, 28. And Elijah was led for 40 days and nights to Mount Oreb, 1 Kings 19, 8. In each in instance, the wilderness was a proving ground. The wilderness was a test of faithfulness. And the wilderness, or in the wilderness, there was a promise of deliverance. Jesus, likewise, has this experience. The third element that sets Jesus aside is that in the end, after conquering both the adversary, as well as, very interesting to note, the danger surrounding the wild beasts around him, he is ministered to by the angels themselves. Now, if you're familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, the angels show up throughout the Scriptures, but they usually come to deliver a message or to carry out God's will. They don't usually come to care for people. Now, Elijah, if you remember, was out in the desert. He needed food. The Israelites were out in the desert, and they needed manna. But in each case, God sent uh, manna or the food in case he sent birds to bring the food to Elijah by natural means. But in this case, we have angels that show up specifically to minister to Jesus. It is clear that Mark is painting a picture here that something different, that something divine is happening. He is here. Then in uh, verse 14, Mark ties it all together and Jesus is preaching. And his message is that he's come to establish the new kingdom God had promised. Mark writes that Jesus shared just this. The time has come. The time has come. What time? What time has come? The time for God's kingdom to become preeminent and for the people to truly change, that is, repent and believe the eongelion, that is, the good news that He is here. Now, it's here that we have to pause, and not just because we just got through all our verses. We have to pause because Mark tips his hand here. He tells us right up front who Jesus is and the importance he is in the history of mankind. However, there is something wrong with Mark's claim, and it all boils down to the word expectation. Expectation. Now, when my kids uh, were younger, they took swimming lessons and uh, at differing levels. And at the end of the week or two of their swimming lessons, um, they all got this little certificate, you know, that they had graduated the fish or the sharks or whatever it was. And then they opened up a, a bag of candy and they said each kid could have two pieces of candy. Now, most of the kids were like, uh certificate and two pieces of candy. But the king kids were like, two pieces of candy? That's great. They're all excited. Why? Well, besides the fact that the king family's a little stingy, you know, <laughs> one piece of candy a day the week after Halloween. Um, it, it just They had a different expectation. They, the expectation that candy was a special thing and they didn't get a whole lot of it, and to get two pieces was a big deal. See, how we perceive something often reflects our expectation. For instance, if you were to receive a $2,000 bonus from your work, your expectation would dictate your reaction. 
So if the bonus came out of the blue, you would be elated at the generous gift. You would be like, yes, this is awesome. But if you had just landed the biggest multi-million dollar client that your company ever had, and you were expecting a bonus in excess of $10,000, well, you'd be extremely disappointed at just two. Your and mine preconceived expectations often is the deciding factor on whether or not news is good or bad or even if it's true or false. Now, I want you to take a moment. I want you to use your imaginations with me and pretend that you're a Jew in the dawn of the first century, okay? I know it's tough to leave the cell phone and the internet and the air conditioning, all that behind, but let's just do it for a moment. And remember, you live in a foreign occupied territory of Israel. You have seen firsthand and experienced the tyranny of Rome from your earliest days. They are the bad guys. Likewise, you have been taught from childhood that someday God will free the Jewish race from Rome when the Messiah comes. Your father, your grandfather, your mother, your grandmother, and even your rabbi have constantly told you stories about this Messiah and what you can expect. You've heard how God promises in Deuteronomy 33 that the Messiah would restore the fortunes back to Israel and he would gather all the Jews together and bring them back to their home country of Israel. You've heard careful descriptions that the Messiah would bring worldwide peace, and that according to Isaiah, swords would be turned into plows, and peoples from all nations would come to worship God in His holy temple in Jerusalem. Likewise, the Jews would enter a new age that the prophet of Ezekiel declared that the people would delight in and follow all of God's laws and decrees, and the world would acknowledge that God is the one and only true God. In essence, you have been taught that the Messiah would be like the great king of old, King David, but that his reign would be universal, not just a section of the world, universal, and it would bring utopia to the Jews for the rest of eternity. This is what you've been taught from the very, very beginning. This is what you've prayed for. You heard your parents and your grandparents, your, your entire community. And every time something horrible happens, this is the cry of the people. Now, if this is your expectation of Messiah, imagine someone declares to you he is here. Imagine they declare to you that he has come. Based on your expectations, what do you think your reaction would be? Confusion? Disappointment, or perhaps disbelief? Most likely, your first reaction would not be jubilation. Because the decoration, what? Does not match your expectation. Mark's letter paints a vivid picture that Jesus showed himself, if you would, proved himself to be the Messiah with great power and authority, but that he was unexpectedly also the Son of God, who set up a kingdom where He chooses to serve rather than to be served. The church in Rome is first introduced to the evidence that Jesus was the promised Messiah. That's the first half of the book of Mark. And then they have to come face to face with the fact that the Messiah didn't come to fulfill their expectations, but instead to fulfill God's expectations. Hopefully you're a little bit more understanding now of their interaction with Jesus. Hopefully you're, you're, you, you kind of get a, a grip. Well, maybe they weren't as crazy as we think they were. When Jesus kept telling them over and over who he was and what he was going to do, and they just did not get it. To help, let's fast forward to today. This might be a good chance to excuse yourself. You may not want to hear this part. We're about to go on to a grand journey together as we go through the book of Mark. We're going to experience Jesus up close and personal as we study, as we see him, as we see a portrait of Jesus through the book of Mark. 
And remember that what you hear is, is for the most part, it's Peter's firsthand account. He was there from the beginning, and he was even in that inner circle. However, I warn you, whether you're new to Jesus, you're just checking out this Jesus thing, or you've heard this story several times before, you need to be careful. I need to be careful of our expectations because they can deceive you. See, we all come, myself included, with expectation or basic beliefs of what God should be like and therefore what his son should teach and be like. These expectations probably and usually seem good and reasonable, not only to you, but probably to those around you. For instance, you may expect that if God is real, he will present himself in a way that you can measure, test, and prove to be true over and over again in the same way. I mean, if God is real, we should be able to apply the scientific method to him. Or you may have the expectation that if God is good, he will never allow anything bad to happen to good people. Or you may have the expectation that if God loves us, he will protect us from anything really bad, and, he, and we will know only blessing all the days of our lives. Or perhaps you have the same expectation that most of us American bred people do, and I'm talking about the folks in the church, that a good, loving, and true God shows himself to be all those things by using his power to make my life work. His job is to make me happy. Now, if you've been around Trinity Church for long, you know we've addressed this, and God ain't like any of these things. But in true confession, that doesn't change the fact that I still have these tapes in the back of my head. I did not write what I thought about you guys. I wrote down what I thought about me and my expectations. We still struggle with this. We still filter what happens to us through these mis-expectations. The truth is, though, that God is very different than our expectations. This doesn't make him any less God, though. It means that we have the wrong expectations. The question we need to be asking and answering is not, how can God make my life better? Or even, is Jesus the way of peace and prosperity for me? Rather, the first question is simply, is Jesus the Messiah and the Son of God? If the answer is no, if he's not those two things, then it really doesn't matter what he said that he could do or not do for us. He was just another good religious guy in the landscape of history. However, if he's the promised Messiah and living Son of God, then we have to come to him on his terms. It doesn't really matter whether he makes my life work or not. What matters is that he is God's answer to the age-old problem of our separation from God. And whatever he says we must believe or do or become, we need to do, whether it meets our expectations or not. Let me kind of wrap this up with this idea. The world, in, in its greatest stretch of the imagination, never expected God himself to come. It, it, it just is not on the radar that God himself would put on flesh, that God himself would live as a servant to the very ones that he created, that he would allow himself to be the subject of cruelty of those he created, that he would die such a horrendous death, the death of a criminal and an enemy of the state. As a matter of fact, this is the major stumbling block of the two other monotheistic religions in the world, both Judaism and Islam, fundamentally reject Jesus because he just can't be that. God cannot do that. He would not do that. That's outside their expectation. And so they don't even look at it because it just can't happen. But the question for you and I isn't for us. Fundamentally, it just can't happen because God doesn't meet my expectation. Fundamentally is, did it happen? Because if it did, we need to change our expectation. The very, this very idea that God entered history that way for you and I, because he loved us, should rock our world. 
And if it is true, it should be enough to begin to change the rest of our expectations. So here's my challenge for you, for me. I'm, I'm not asking you to buy into this lock, stock, and barrel. Because what Mark does is he, he in his first 15 verses, he, he kind of, like I say, he tips his hand, he introduces us to this. But then he's going to take the rest of the book and he's going to develop this portrait of Jesus. And he's going to show how he wasn't what we expected, but prove that whether we expect it or not, he was who he said he was. And then he's going to show a very different vision of what this Messiah would be. And so my challenge to you is to just join me on this journey and say, you know what, I'm going to take my expectations, again, whether you believe in this Jesus thing or not, and I'm going to set them aside, and I'm just going to hear, I just want to experience this portrait of Jesus. And then I'm going to weigh just what I hear and see, whether or not it's true. And then based on that, I will either stick with my expectations or I will adjust my expectations. Is that fair? Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for your word. I don't always understand it, dear God, but I guess when I truly open my heart, it's not as confusing as I thought. <laughs> so I pray, dear Lord, um, as people are here from all different places, that you do the work that only you can do in our heart and lives. That you pull back the veil of our expectations and reveal yourself. And, and probably more importantly, dear God, that because you're into revealing yourself, you have no problem with that. We have a problem with receiving that. And so I pray, dear God, that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, may help us to see and then have the courage not to run the other direction. If you'll keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed just for a second, I'd like to uh, pray for you. If you're here uh, today and you're either new to this Jesus deal or, quite frankly, you don't really buy it at all. But you're willing, if God is real, you're willing to have the eyes of your soul opened and to experience him. If you're willing for that to happen, you'd like me to pray for you. If you would just quickly raise your hand so I can see it. So I just know to pray for you. I'm not gonna, that's all we're going to do. Just raise your hand real quickly and put it down. Okay. Let me pray for you. Father God, I just lift these folks up uh, who are here today, dear Lord, that um, they're seeking something. I, I, I believe it's you, but from their perspective, God, they're probably not sure who or what it is, but there's something missing. And if this is it, if God, if you are real and, and you really loved us this much, they, they want to know that. And I know, dear Lord, it probably won't look the way that we would like it to look, you know, where you send a heavenly being and, or an email or a phone call and voice from heaven. But that doesn't mean, dear Lord, that you don't want to speak, that you don't want to make yourself known to us. For this, you say, is eternal life, that we may know you. And so I pray, dear God, that the scales from their eyes may fall, even though that they see, dear God, that spiritually they are blind, we are blind. I pray that those scales may fall and they may get a clear glimpse of you and that you may give them the courage, dear God, to continue to pursue you. And knowing, dear Lord, that they don't have to make the change, Lord, that if they receive you, you will make the change in them that they cannot do themselves. I just pray that you do that miracle in their life. If there's anyone here today uh, maybe you came and you're encouraged by the message, but, but quite frankly, there's, there's um, a pain in your life. There's struggles in your life that kind of overshadow this, that you're like, that's great that God wants me to come to him on his terms, but man, it'd be nice if he took care of this. <laughs> this is hard. 
this is tough, this is painful, and you, and you just would like that God who loves you, you know that to be true, to minister to you and to do a miracle in your life in that way. If you'd like me to pray for that, if you just quickly raise your hand, I'll be, all right, got you, got you. Okay, you can put them down. Let me just pray for you real quick. Father God, I lift up my brothers and sisters who, like myself, are experiencing real life, dear Lord. And first of all, God, I thank you that, that even though you call us to be about your agenda, it's clear in your scriptures that you don't mind, that you actually love to give good gifts to your sons and daughters, that, that we are to look to you, dear Father, as the comforter, as the, as the healer, dear Lord. And I thank you for that aspect. And so I just, I pray for all those who raise their hand and for myself as well, dear God, that, that um, you would come in and be the great comforter, that you would come in and give us a strength beyond our own, dear God. Lord, I pray, dear Father, for in situations that would glorify you, dear God, that you heal, that you mend, dear God, that you change circumstances. But, but on the other side, dear God, there may be some circumstances here that, that, um, that you're going to make beautiful in a different way. And so I pray, dear Lord, that you help us be patient. You help us to have the true belief that knowing that you are a good God and that kind of like little children, we got to eat our vegetables right now. Help us have that trust in a good daddy. Give us a strength that's not our own, dear Father. Give us peace in the midst of the storm. And lastly, if, if this time you just want... Um, if you want to see Jesus become not an idea, but a real um, person that you connected, that you know on a daily basis, if you're hoping that God will continue that and use this, this season of life to do that in your life, if you'll just raise your hand so I can pray for you real quickly. If that's what your desire of your heart is. I see it. I see it. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay, you can put them down. Let me just pray for you. Father God, like I said before, uh, you said, Jesus said, that eternal life is knowing you, Jesus, and the one who sent you, the Father. That's what eternal life is. Not something that happens after we die, but something that happens now. It's knowing you. And God, I desire, and, and those who rose their hands, whether physically or emotionally, dear Father, we desire to know you, not not in a way like we know about George Washington, but in a very real way where I met with him this morning. He is active and alive in my heart and my life. I can hear him. He guides me in a real way. We desire to know you more. We desire to experience and, and your love more. Would you do that work in and through us? And Lord, I just pray, I thank you that where we are weak, where we want to run from your holy presence, um, you can do in and through us what we cannot do ourselves. That you'll take us even when we want to run away. And so I pray when that reaction comes that you pursue us and you catch us. And we may catch ourselves, dear Father, and turn around. And even in the midst of our worst moments, know that you love your children who love you in back. Help us love you. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.